Welcome to Smarter Circuits. I'm your host, Ian Klein. This is a thermostat. So is this. And this, but we'll get to that. This is undoubtedly going to be a long video, so I have broken it out into chapters if you'd like to skip to the meat and potatoes, so to speak. However, I highly recommend not doing so. When you are building a machine to accomplish a task, it is best that you understand not only the full scope of the task to be performed, but also how others have accomplished the same. Even if you know most of what I'm about to tell you, it's worth reviewing and focusing your attention on the minutia. First, the obligatory short history. The first thermostats used to regulate temperature were created in the 1830s by a Scottish chemist named Andrew Ure. These were used to maintain boiler temperature in a textile mill. His bimetallic strip is still seen today, though the design and overall idea was improved upon several fold over the years. One such improvement, and perhaps the most fundamentally modern, was made in 1880 by Wisconsin professor Warren Johnson, who created the first electrical thermostat to regulate temperature inside of a building. A few years later, in 1883, Albert Butts adapted the thermostat to regulate coal furnaces using a damper flapper to control air intake, filing a patent in 1836. This version is the basis for most HVAC system controls today. The idea of programming these devices came in 1906 when Mark Honeywell, an engineer in Indiana, implemented a clock as a timing device to add another dimension of control to the thermostat. In 1952, Honeywell released the dial thermostat and it quickly became a standard. By the 1960s, most homes had dial thermostats. Many older homes still do. In the 1980s, digital display thermostats and electronic sensors started becoming more common. The integration of simple programmable circuitry allowed fine scheduling and automatic switching of heating and cooling systems easier and eventually led to internet connectivity. Most of the smart thermostats on the market today are cloud connected. I'm not necessarily comfortable with some of these designs due to what I perceive as reliability issues. While I have not tested a Nest, for instance, I have tested some thermostats offered by companies such as Honeywell and have found some pretty fatal flaws in both design and security. I'll be doing a video series in the not too distant future covering security in home automation devices. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't use these devices as a matter of safety in general. The security and reliability concerns with these devices are limited to some fairly outlying cases. I do, however, like to build my own solutions, and one of the benefits is that my devices do not require third-party servers or internet connectivity to function, even to log data for a long period of time. I'd like to point out one very nice thing about smart thermostats like the Nest. There are areas in the US that I'm aware of where you can actually delegate control of your thermostat settings to the local utility companies in order to save energy, and so they have a better control in extreme climate conditions. This is pretty awesome, and I think it's a great thing for a lot of reasons. My devices don't allow for this, nor do many of the cheaper smart thermostats on the market, but I personally account for the same situations in much the same ways as those utility companies. So I would say if you're interested in that sort of thing, prepare to do a lot of research and conditional logic programming, or just buy a Nest. Now, with that out of the way, let's look at the function of a thermostat. There are a few high-level things we need to understand about what we're trying to accomplish and the limits we must work within. First, when we're heating or cooling, we're simply converting or moving the energy around. You don't need to understand this in too much depth, but it helps to keep it in mind. In most homes, you will have two primary systems to do this, a furnace and an air conditioner. The configuration of these is only marginally important for our purposes here because most of these systems are designed to support a single standard of controls that has been around for some time. In other words, we're not controlling the method of heating or cooling, just the timing. Most furnaces and air conditioners are static output devices. That is, you cannot tell your furnace to only produce a portion of its heat output. It's all or nothing. This is why thermostats are such clever devices. Their task is simple. Turn on the heat when it is too cold and turn on the cooling when it is too hot. But this simple task has some sneaky difficulties. For instance, if you turn the heat on when the temperature in a room is below 70 degrees and off when it is above 70, the heat will toggle on and off more rapidly than is efficient. To avoid this, the thermostat must let the temperature get a little beyond its target before turning the heating or cooling system off. In older mechanical thermostats, this was accomplished by placing a magnet below the contact on the bimetallic switch that resisted the pull of the coil as the change in temperature started to pull it away. This also made for a cleaner break in the circuit. 
In most digital thermostats, this is done with a timing circuit or program of some sort that says to leave the system on for a certain amount of time after the desired temperature has been reached, or simply add or subtract a degree from the triggering temperature to get the target temperature. This last method is the one we'll employ in this build, as I prefer the consistency of condition to the predictability of energy consumption. Another consideration is air circulation. When you're moving the air around your house, it is exchanging thermal energy with all of the surfaces it comes into contact with. Towards the end of this video, I'm going to discuss using this as well as ways of moving air in and out of the house. But the typical home setup may not have access to some of the features my home does, such as a whole house fan. We will start with a basic thermostat to control a heating system, then we will look at air conditioning, then circulation and ventilation. There are some code examples I'll show, but I won't spend too much time on them. The source code for this episode will be available on the GitHub repo linked in the description. Links to all the components used will also be in the description. For this build, we're using the Raspberry Pi Zero W. We have a 16 gigabyte SD card with a fresh headless installation of Raspbian on it. You could also use a touchscreen with this and install the desktop, but in my system, I can control the thermostat settings from any of the touchscreens in the house, so I didn't bother with this. We have a five volt power supply, which is necessary in my setup. This may be inconvenient for some, but there's also another possibility if you have a common wire coming from your furnace to the thermostat. Not all houses have this, and I'll discuss it in detail when we get to installation, but if you do, you'll also need a buck converter that can handle 24 volts DC and convert it to five volts. I actually wish I had this option myself. We have a four channel relay shield or hat for the Raspberry Pi, this is just a conveniently packed relay board. You could use any one of a variety of these. In fact, I use a three relay module for the small unit in the game room and an eight relay module for the main furnace and central air. The reason for this is mostly due to that board being what I grabbed when I decided to experiment and it worked so well I used it for the final setup. Also, it is in close proximity to the whole house fan control, which I plan to wire into the relay board at some point. The whole house fan is currently being controlled by a Shelly relay, but this is less than ideal for reasons I'll explain later. Finally, we have the DHT11 digital humidity and temperature sensor. There are slightly more precise sensors available and feel free to use them, but this sensor is probably considerably more accurate than most home thermostats are anyway. And that's all right because they're only getting a general idea of the temperature of your house from a single point, a topic I'll cover in another video. Let's assemble our device. The first thing you'll need to do is solder your headers on if you've purchased the Pi Zero without headers as I have. The reason I've done so in this case is so I could solder in these extended stackable headers to give me easy access to the GPIO pins for the sensor even with the relay board attached. The next step is pretty simple. Install the relay board on the Raspberry Pi by connecting it directly to the GPIO pins. Now we'll connect the VCC pin of the DHT11 sensor to one of the 5 volt header pins, the ground to a ground pin, and the signal pin to pin 17. You can use another pin if you like, but I know this one is free as the relay board here uses pins 4, 22, 6, and 26 as relay channels 1, 2, 3, and 4 respectively. I also like to keep the I2C pins clear for another use later on. Now, with our SD card installed and our Wi-Fi and SSH configured in the boot folder, we can power the Raspberry Pi on and log in to make the necessary configuration changes and add our Python script. The first thing our script needs to do is read and track the temperature readings. We have access to the humidity reading as well, so we can store it for later use. I'd like the viewer to keep in mind that the humidity we're reading here is relative humidity, which is the measure of how much of the air's capacity to hold moisture is taken up by moisture. This capacity is relative to the air temperature. Warmer air holds more moisture, so 50% humidity at 70 degrees is more actual moisture than 50% humidity at 65 degrees. The next thing our script needs to do is tell the heat to come on when the temperature drops below a desired number. Here we simply turn the relay channel 1 on or off, which we will connect to our heat signal wire later. In our main loop, when we drop below the desired temperature, we want to tell the heat to stay on until we've gone 1 degree over that setting on the way up so we don't have to turn the heat right back on. If you're only controlling a heater or furnace, this is as far as you really need to go here. You can proceed to installation from this point. 
From here, we'll look at similar code to control the air conditioning. We need to be able to turn relay channel 2 on or off, which will connect to the cooling signal wire later during installation. Now, when we see our temperature has risen above the desired temperature range, we run the cooling system until we reach 1 degree below our upper temperature limit. Keeping the upper and lower limit a couple degrees apart will at least curtail the necessity to disable one system at a time in order to avoid potentially flipping back and forth between heating and cooling as the temperature may fluctuate more than expected depending on many practically unforeseeable circumstances. Most furnaces by themselves will also have a fan signal wire you can use to ensure air circulation. In our code, if we remember every time a circuit has been turned off, we can tell the system to turn the fan on if another heating or cooling cycle doesn't happen within a certain time frame. This ensures air circulation. This is something you may want to experiment with in your own house to find your desired conditions. In this code, we're switching relay channel 3 on or off when we want the fan-only mode of our system. There are some extra checks and validations in the code on the repo that ensure you don't do bad things like set the lower limit higher than the upper limit and so on. The last thing I want to discuss connecting to this system is ventilation. If your house is equipped with a whole house fan like this one, you may want to consider wiring your thermostat to control it. Right now, my thermostat sends a command to a Shelly relay to turn my whole house fan on at high speed for the first 10 minutes of a cooling cycle when the temperature is more than 2 degrees above the upper limit. This actually allows me to remove excess heat energy the house itself has absorbed from more than just the outside air, such as the sun itself. At night, this time doubles if the external air temperature is below the internal air temperature, which happens a lot in the late summer here. It may be 80 degrees outside during the day and 75 inside, then the air outside may drop to as low as 60 degrees and the house is so warm that moving the air from outside to inside and venting the air inside out is more efficient than using the air conditioner to move that energy. If the temperature in the house is more than 3 degrees higher than the setting and the outside temperature is lower, the system will also turn on the two bathroom vent fans as well, which move about 150 cubic feet of air per minute each. That's nothing compared to the 1200 CFM the whole house fan moves, but it contributes significantly, especially since the air in those rooms is hard to draw out because they're pretty isolated areas with only one portal. Now, I mentioned that my whole house fan is controlled by a single Shelly relay, and astute listeners will have noticed I said it comes on at high speed. The reason for this is that my whole house fan uses two separate winding wires for its speed. In this particular motor, you simply power one winding for low and one for high. You just can't power both at the same time. Well, you can, but it would likely consume a lot of power and burn the motor out after a time. This is the original switch. It is designed so that you can't flip it quickly from one speed to the other and risk an arc allowing both windings to be energized at the same time. There is a distinct and intentional stop between them. To emulate this with two relays, we don't want to run one relay to the low winding and one relay to the high winding. Instead, we run the normally open contact of the first relay to the line terminal of the second. We run the low speed winding on the normally closed terminal of the second relay and the high speed winding to the normally open one. This way, we can select the speed using the second relay and the powered state using the first. This is one reason I'm keeping the 8 relay board for the main thermostat for my house. I will have one relay for heating, one relay for cooling, one relay for circulation, one for the whole house fan power, one for the whole house fan speed, and three left over. The leftover relays will eventually be designated to humidification and dehumidification systems I will cover in future videos, as well as possibly the radiant heat flooring that's planned for the bathrooms. Again, content for a future video. Now, here we are at the wall. You can see there's a yellow wire, a white wire, a green wire, and a red wire. The red wire is the 24 volt hot wire you'll want to connect to the line terminals of all of your relays that control the furnace. If you have a blue wire here, congratulations, you have a common wire to feed the 24 volt back to in order to power your thermostat. The red and blue wire give you a constant power supply that won't require another circuit being on to complete. We use the white wire with our heat cycle relay, the yellow wire with our cool cycle relay, and the green wire with our circulation cycle relay. The code I've put on the repo also includes functions to send the thermostat readings to an MQTT topic, as well as receive settings from a different topic. The details are included in the notes and comments for that code. I have plans to 3D print shells for these so they look a little better, which I'll share on the various platforms when they're done. 
So that's it. There's all sorts of things you can do in code to make this thermostat do all kinds of tricks. I've included some example upgrades on the repo, such as scheduling and logging. Now you can control your heating and cooling your own way. If you have some deeper understanding of thermodynamics than the average bear, this is a great tool for saving energy and being handy on a budget. Remember, while this video showed you step by step how to make this thermostat, it's only meant to be a foundation for you to build your own ideas on and implement in whatever way is safest and most beneficial to you. If you're not fully comfortable with your knowledge of electrical safety, furnaces, thermostats, or electronics in general, you may want to try some more basic devices before jumping into modifying your home's HVAC controls. Though the systems themselves are designed to prevent catastrophic situations, you could very well wear out components or run your energy bill up without proper knowledge going in. This is meant as a reminder to always research and find more than one source of information before embarking on something this complex, not to dissuade you from trying this yourself. I do hope you enjoyed the video, and of course if you did enjoy it and haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the channel. If you want to know what's going on between episodes, you can follow Smarter Circuits on Twitter, at Circuits Smarter, and if you'd like to help make more and better videos possible, consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page linked below. Thank you for listening to me ramble, and I do hope you'll join me for future videos as I continue building Smarter Circuits.